Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, over the last two hours, we have been listening to the virtuosity of two wonderful molecules. One historically very strong, Philip Holm started the discovery absolutely dating back to 1914. And then Dr. S.K. Sharma ended with an exhaustive review of GLP-1 agonists. Now what I'm going to do is to see whether this combination is going to be of any use in clinical practice. Today unequivocal evidence exists that good glycemic control early in the natural history of type 2 diabetes makes a very meaningful impact in reducing both microvascular and macrovascular complications. So much so that if you look at the UK PDS follow-up data, the benefit is not only visible in the early part of the trial, but also 20 years down the line, you continue to see the benefit in reduction of microvascular and even the macrovascular complications. Very recently, in 2015, we have got a very interesting publication from the DCCT EDIC investigator group, and they have demonstrated 33% reduction in mortality in those type 1 diabetic patients who were intensively treated at the time of diagnosis. So today there is absolutely unequivocal evidence that good glycemic control is mandated and it is mandated much early in the natural history of type 2 diabetes. But what are we doing in real life practice? Across the world, the various agencies, the regulatory agencies, the professional bodies, they have given you the target of 6.5% to 7% of HbA1c. But what are we doing? We are doing horrible. And it's not one country. We are talking of the whole world. We are not achieving good glycemic control at all. And particularly, if we look at this issue as to why is this happening, I think we can easily condemn the disease itself, that type 2 diabetes is a disease characterized by inexorable decline in beta cell function and therefore it's a progressive disease and we cannot do anything. But I think the fact of the matter remains that insulin, even though identified as the most important weapon in controlling diabetes, it's very, very underused in clinical practice. If you look at this scenario in India, and this slide has been shown by two previous speakers, the situation is even more horrible. We are not doing well at all on the glycemic front. The HbA1c is off the target. The fasting, the postprandial, the random, everything is off target. We are not doing any good at the lipid level either. We are certainly doing a reasonable thing at the level of the blood pressure control. I think that's one thing which is at least quite heartening from the Diabcure ACI study 2011. Less than 20% of our patients are at target of HbA1c, and that calls for some urgent action. We know for sure that even though insulin is very effective, but there are a number of limitations. There are a number of roadblocks which are responsible as to why physicians are either reluctant to initiate insulin or to optimize insulin or to intensify when it is required. And I believe that hypoglycemia and weight gain are the two most important limiting factors for all these difficulties in a starting and maintaining insulin treatment. If we take up the first issue, whether you are talking of UK PDS, where the patients were recruited at the time of diagnosis, or you talk about the advanced record and the VADT, where the patients had already spent almost a decade after diagnosis. The moment you embark upon intensive glycemic control, you end up paying the price by incurring a higher incidence of hypoglycemia. And this is the UK PDS data regarding the weight gain. You can see here, in the entire duration of the study and in the follow-up, there is a progressive rise in the body weight, whatever treatment modality you use, particularly with insulin and sulfonylurea. And in the ACORD study, there were 28% of the patients who actually gained more than 10 kilograms of weight. And in the VADT trial, the average increase in the body weight was 8.2 kilograms. So ladies and gentlemen, hypoglycemia and weight gain indeed are very, very important issues. 
And when you look at the insulins which are available, you are trying to aim at less than 7% of A1C. There are differences within the insulin family. As you can see here, compared to NPH, when you are talking of insulin detimer, at every level of HbA1c, you have lower incidence of hypoglycemia with insulin detimer. But certainly that doesn't negate the fact that when you move from a higher HbA1c to lower HbA1c, any insulin will increase the risk of hypoglycemia. But it is different within different insulins. And when you look at the weight gain, you can see here, it doesn't matter which insulin you are using, you are going to end up with significant weight gain. Can we address the problem by interjecting this GLP receptor agonist that Dr. S.K. Sharma alluded to very, very elegantly? I think it really stands to reason as to why these two molecules should be combined. First, look at this simple clinical outcome. We know that a basal insulin will have a very robust effect in reducing the fasting plasma glucose and we heard from Dr. Sharma that GLP-1 receptor agonist will have a very robust effect on reducing the postprandial hyperglycemia and still quite significant effect also on reducing the fasting plasma glucose. So obviously the issue of hypoglycemia and weight gain which we see with the basal insulin will be quite nicely attenuated by addition of a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Now the point is that the moment you embark upon a new strategy, a new paradigm shift, then you have to have some backing from the professional recommending bodies. And when you look at the 2015 ADA ESD recommendation for glycemia management in type 2 diabetes, you can clearly see that basal insulin and GLP-1 receptor agonist both occupy the tier 2 recommendation and then tier 3 and in fact in the entire continuum of management of type 2 diabetes. So scientifically we can combine these two molecules but then we need some very scientific proof that this combination could be really important and beneficial to our patients. I'm going to take you through some very exciting data from these three clinical studies. The first is the Lira Detimer studies and the very name suggests that in this study you are going to use a GLP-1 analog first and then if you are not on target you are going to add insulin detimer. And the second study is Lira add to basal and again the name suggests that first you use the basal insulin and then if you are not at target you add a GLP-1 analog in this case liraglutide. And the last study is the begin study which was basically and a study on insulin degludec and subsequently those patients who could not achieve the target there was addition of liraglutide. And I'll first take the Lira detimer study. Obviously these are the patients of type 2 diabetes who are on a combination of oral anti-diabetic drugs and they are given the optimal dose of liraglutide 1.8 milligram. Ladies and gentlemen what do we expect? It's very interesting to see that 61% of patients are on target just by addition of a GLP-1 analog and that is liraglutide. So you really don't need to use insulin in large number of patients. So you carry on with this group of patients what we call the observational group and you don't do anything else just carry on with the OAD combination with liraglutide. But in the 39% of the patients who do not achieve the target of less than HB 7%, you randomize either to insulin detimer or do nothing, just carry on. And not surprisingly, when you look at the result from this study, which group did the best? The group which originally had 61% of them who got the best control right in the beginning, they continued to have the lowest HbA1c level. And then the other group, out of the 39%, those who were added insulin detimer, they achieved a better A1C reduction. And not surprisingly, when you added nothing, you did not have a significant reduction in the HbA1C. So very clear that the best outcome that you expect is that on a failure of oral therapy, you first add a GLP-1 analog and then if you are not on target, 
you add a basal insulin and that makes a lot of sense. Do you pay any price for that? Because you are adding insulin, you expect that it will increase the risk of weight gain. Now it doesn't. As you can see here, in spite of addition of insulin detimia, the weight has not gone up. The weight continues to be lower. Of course, compared to liraglutide, there is slight increase, but this difference is 0.3 kilogram, that is 300 grams, which is absolutely not of any clinical significance. When we look at the incidence of hypoglycemia, it's absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing. So you are embarking on a journey of combining insulin with a molecule which completely mitigates or attenuates the issue of hypoglycemia in clinical practice, which is the biggest limiting factor for a starting and continuing insulin treatment. And there was no severe hypoglycemia. Now when we talk of even minor hypoglycemia and compare the results of this trial with the other studies where we have been using insulin glargine or insulin detimia, you can see this huge reduction in the incidence of hypoglycemia. So combining a basal insulin, insulin degludec or insulin detimia with GLP-1 analog is a fantastic idea. Now let's look at the second study, what we call the LIRA add to basal therapy. And as the name suggests, these are the patients who are already using a basal insulin, any basal insulin, insulin glargine or detimere or whatever. And these are the type 2 diabetic patients who are not on target. The A1C is between 7 to 10 percent. And then they are randomized either addition of a liraglutide or addition of a placebo. And not surprisingly, addition of liraglutide leads to a very smart reduction in the HbA1c as compared to placebo. And this is not very difficult to understand. But what is more important is that when you look at this body weight issue again, in spite of being insulin on board, you continue to have the benefit of weight reduction. And similarly, when you look at the incidence of hypoglycemia, you are not increasing the risk of hypoglycemia because of this combination. So once again, it really doesn't matter that whether you are using a GLP-1 first or an insulin, basal insulin first, you continue to have the benefit of better HbA1c reduction, continue to have the benefit of weight loss and without increasing the risk of hypoglycemia. However, one very important message comes out from these two studies. You saw in the first study, Lira Detimere study, that the group which achieved the HbA1c of less than 7% right in the beginning, they continued to do the best. And in the second study again, the basal insulin, if it had a good control, they continue to do very well. And in the next study, I am going to take this data further, that how important it is to achieve glycemic control. It doesn't matter whether with this molecule or that molecule. If you achieve a glycemic control early in the natural history, that is going to be very beneficial in the entire course of type 2 diabetes management. Now, we were all involved with the beginner study. This, is what, this was the original approval study for insulin degludec. And then we had the extension of this study called the once long study. And you can hear, see here, once again, patients who were treated with insulin degludec, and if they achieved the target, you just completed, continued the observational group where you just used metformin and insulin degludec. And those who were not on target, <coughs> they were added either insulin aspart or a liraglutide. Now, Samit Gosal talked very nicely about this combination of adding insulin as part to insulin degludec. So you have two options here. When you are trying to intensify treatment, whether you would like to add an insulin or you would like to add a liraglutide. That's what you are thinking. And within the insulin, obviously, because you are already using a basal insulin, so obviously you will use a rapid-acting insulin analog. And now let us look at the data. And the data here again shows you that those who achieved with insulin degludec alone continue to do better than the other two groups. And then, of course, addition of liraglutide to insulin degludec was better than addition of insulin as part to uh, insulin degludec. So that clearly tells us that good glycemic control is the most important thing much early in the natural history. And then addition of a GLP-1 analog 
two basal insulin is a better idea than adding an insulin as part. Of course, when you have to further intensify the treatment, as Samit Gosal said, use twice daily IDEG as, and that could be a wonderful thing. But when you are talking of the first injectable space after failure of the oral therapy, I think it's nice to start with a GLP-1 analog or a combination of a GLP-1 analog and a basal insulin. Or vice versa, you can intensify the treatment on that pattern. And again, in this study also, you continue to have the benefit of weight loss. And again, in this study, because you are comparing with insulin as part, there is a huge reduction in the incidence of confirmed hypoglycemia and also 86% reduction in the incidence of nocturnal hypoglycemia. So adding GLP-1 receptor agonist to a basal insulin leads to a huge impact in reducing the incidence of hypoglycemia. If you look at a composite picture of every single study which has been done on a combination of GLP-1 receptor agonist and basal insulin, across the board, it doesn't matter whether you are using an exenatide twice daily or you are using uh, lixisenatide or liraglutide or albiglutide, across the board, there is very impressive reduction in the HbA1c. And you continue to see the benefit of weight reduction with almost all the GLP-1 receptor agonist and basal insulin combination. So ladies and gentlemen, I think whether you start with a GLP-1 and then add insulin, or whether you start with a basal insulin and then add a GLP-1 analog, HbA1c reduction, weight loss, and hypoglycemia reduction gives you the benefit of this wonderful combination. So I would like to conclude my talk that combination of a basal insulin and GLP-1 receptor agonist has proved to be a very important therapeutic option and I would say a very important therapeutic advance. Effective glycemic control, low rates of hypoglycemia and weight loss maintained in, during the course of treatment is something which is addressing the unmet need in the management paradigm. And when we talk of this synergistic benefit between a GLP-1 receptor agonist and basal insulin diabetes management, I think all the three trials that I showed you, they used a GLP-1 receptor and a basal insulin in two different syringes. I think the way forward, the future could be that if we could combine the GLP-1 receptor agonist liraglutide and the basal insulin, insulin degludec, in one pre-filled syringe, making life very simple for our patient. And ladies and gentlemen, that's the molecule IDEG Lira, which Dr. Sharma tried to introduce. Thank you very much. I think this is the future of diabetes management.